For now, let's tell you about the world's largest active volcano. It started to erupt for the first time in nearly 40 years. The authorities have warned. While there are horrifying natural calamities such as hurricanes and tsunamis, volcanoes have an especially horrible personality. They are, of course, more than merely molten rock sprouting meltings. Volcanoes are raging messengers of death and destruction that emanate from the planet's core. Five to ten volcanoes are estimated to be capable of catastrophic eruption that might have devastating environmental consequences. One of these volcanoes, which lies beneath Sumatra's Lake Toba, has erupted twice in the last million years. Is this earth-shattering volcano about to explode? And if so, what are our chances of survival? Let us find out in this video. Volcanic eruptions have wreaked havoc on human civilizations throughout history, including the well-known Vesuvius eruption in 79 AD, which murdered the people of Pompeii and preserved their bodies in ash. More recently, in Indonesia, Mel Tambora altered the climate, producing 1816, the year without a summer. Supervolcanic eruptions are among the most destructive natural disasters on the planet, yet they only occur every 17,000 years or so. Mount St. Helens 1980 eruption, on the other hand, was the deadliest in American history, killing 57 people. A major volcanic eruption, despite emitting only one cubic kilometer of ash, could plunge the Earth into a volcanic winter of turmoil and famine, in addition to bringing death and destruction. Lake Toba is a beautiful site. Samosia, the largest and deepest lake in Southeast Asia, is home to the world's largest island within an island and the sixth largest lake island. In Samosia, there are two smaller lakes, Lake City Holi and Lake Egg Natonang. The former even has its own island in Sumatra's northwestern region. Highlands, it has the best view of Lake Toba and Samosia and the Tuk Tuk Peninsula is where the majority of guests land. In tourist literature, it is characterized as a great area to do nothing and to sit back, relax, and absorb. But this peacefulness masks a dangerous underbelly. The October supervolcano, which is still active, lies below the calm water of Lake Toba on the Indonesian island of Sumatra. Lake Toba is a 100-kilometer-long crater that was the site of Earth's most recent mega-eruption, about 75,000 years ago. The most powerful eruption on Earth in the last two million years also occurred here. The earliest big eruption in the Lake Toba region happened 1.4 million years ago, from a large stratovolcano at the lake's northwest end. The second occurred 840,000 years ago near the lake's southern end, while the third occurred 500,000 years ago toward the lake's northern end. Of course, the fourth and last event occurred 75,000 years ago. The latest eruption produced lava, or rather tough lava, that normally has a thickness of 50 meters that can reach 400 meters and 600 meters inside the caldera. This eruption's flows reached the ocean of both sides of Sumatra. The faraway Tova ash blanket has been spotted as far away as the Arabian Sea and Lake Malawi encompassing an area estimated to be 7 million square kilometers, around the size of the United States. The Indian Ocean got a lot of it. The average thickness of the ash layers is 10 centimeters, while in Malaysia, 350 kilometers away, it is 90 centimeters and can reach heights of up to 3 meters in India, 3,100 kilometers distant. The thickness of ash layers can range from 50 centimeters to 1 meter, with one location estimating a thickness of up to 6 meters. The heaviest strata are more likely to be found in rivers. The ash distribution indicates that the eruption happened during the northern summer monsoon season. At that time, the winds are blowing towards India. As demonstrated by this, the ash-producing period lasted between 9 and 14 days. To put Tambora and Krakatoa's major eruptions in context, each lasted 24 hours. Despite the fact that Krakatoa had minor eruptions for the previous four months, a total of 2,800 cubic kilometers of material, including approximately 1,000 cubic kilometers of lava, were blasted from Toba. Consider that this one cubic kilometer eruption took six months to complete every two weeks. 
Lackey emitted one cubic kilometer of material while enveloping Iceland. This erupted every 10 minutes from Toba even faster than Tambora. Its pace of eruption was 10 times faster. We can roughly determine how the eruption developed by putting all of the material together. The massive magma chamber was discovered about 10 kilometers beneath the surface. It had been there for approximately 150,000 years, and crystallization had occurred during that time. Because the crystals immersed to deeper levels, the magma chamber's roof eventually began to weaken and dissolve as a result of the intense heat and the magma's buoyancy pushed the roof upward to the points at which it eventually began to break. Unlike typical eruptions, supervolcanoes do not require a new intake of magma to begin an eruption once the mill fraction hits 50%. The pressure of a huge magma chamber, on the other hand, can spontaneously break 10 centimeters of rock. When the melt portion hits 50%, it is probable that significant inflation, possibly hundreds of meters, happened before the breaking, resulting in large earthquakes. The first crack provided a little entrance in the early lava. The eruption quickly became more powerful as the changing pressure beneath caused new fissures. Lava began to flow along the ring fracture from other areas as magma erupted in July or August. It ultimately poured around the entire ring. The length of this initial phase is an educated guess for Krakatoa, which lasted several months. The caldera ring was the source of all eruptions. There was almost certainly no core eruption. Large eruptions may have multiple departure points at the same time. The speeds at which the lava was suddenly erupting surpassed anything seen before on the planet. Fountain collapse, which mainly happened during the early and middle stages of the eruption, created pyroclastic flows that traveled hundreds of kilometers. Sumatra was finally covered with lava and tough to a depth of at least 50 meters. These were also utilized to build the lake's 300-meter-high cliffs. At this time, there could have been one or more extremely powerful explosions that formed an eruption column tens of kilometers high, spreading ash across the Indian Ocean in a variety of locations, but not reaching India. This is controversial because others argue that there is little evidence for such high eruption columns and that all of the lava was elected at a sluggish rate, with tiny ash particles being hurled up to 10 kilometers into the air by the heats of the pyroclastic flows following the trade winds. This ash spread far and wide, enveloping not just India, but also the neighboring Malaysia. This generated the vast majority of the ash. The magma reservoir soon lost enough pressure that the ridge began to collapse rapidly, resulting in a 2-kilometer-deep crater within days or weeks. As the caldera caved deeper, the eruption slowed and the majority of the ejecta now remained inside the caldera. The original reservoir's bottom, which had become silica pore, was where the magma was coming from, with a moan by this point. After the eruption subsided, the volcano remained silent for a long time. Approximately 40,000 years after the eruption, the magma reservoir began to refill, and the caldera's center began to swell. Minor eruptions occurred primarily along the ring fault. The majority of these eruptions were triggered by old magma remains, but in a few cases, new magma also made it to the surface and formed a few cones. Sumatra would surely have been a horrible place covered in lava polluted by gases, and sterilized by a pyroclastic heat. The ash would have utterly destroyed most of the western northwest, which is primarily marine, but also includes Malaysia and a piece of India. But because to the good fortune of the prevailing winds, some places were spared, notably Indonesia, to the east, and the Philippines. It's uncertain what impact this would have had on humanity. If air transport had been established by then, it would have had to be suspended for several years. However, it is thought that the majority of the newly born Homo sapiens were slain, leaving only a tiny number of people to populate the Earth. That would have been the smallest of their worries. Some evidence suggests a genetic bottleneck. It is unknown whether Toba happened concurrently with this bottleneck. A few stone tools discovered beneath the Tober ash in India are equivalent to the many more artifacts discovered above it, demonstrating that the civilization survived even though the surrounding inhabitants did not. Famine would have been unavoidable, 
and the Earth's climate and monsoon would have been irreparably damaged for years or decades. The amount of global cooling, however, is dependent on how much sulfur was ejected, and this number is highly unpredictable. Where the climate-related consequences are substantially harsher, the eruption began almost exactly at the start of a thousand-year glacial era. This could not have happened solely because of Toba. Remember that volcanoes only cause cool summers, not cold winters, but Toba may have influenced ocean currents. Although it is doubtful, this could have pushed the Earth into a new brief ice age. This is highly hypothetical, and the Toba disaster hypothesis is highly exaggerated. However, if this kind of event happened in the present, it would have been terrible. Instead of millions, the number of fatalities could have been in the hundreds of millions. Even now, our society is not prepared to deal with a Tober-sized event. That's all from today's video. Thanks for watching till the end. Let us know your thoughts about supervolcanoes in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.